Good morning, everyone. My name is Merrick Green. I'm the founder managing partner of the law firm General Counsel PC. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, here with me is Joanna Ford, who leads our family law practice, and Evan St. John, who is one of our senior corporate attorneys. So, uh, and we thought this would be uh, teaming them together, a great opportunity to sort of talk to business owners, business executives about what you really need to do to protect your business uh, in a divorce, you know, or, uh, you know, preventively uh, if there is going to be a divorce. So as we go through, um, please use the questions tab within the GoToWebinar uh, uh, control panel, and we will answer those questions as we go through. Um, and with that, I'm going to silence my phone. I apologize. And uh, we will go from there. So uh, very good. So quickly about General Counsel, the firm was founded in 2004. Uh, we serve as outside General Counsel to small, medium-sized businesses, nonprofits, uh, do a lot of work for executives on non-compete severance agreements. And this spring we added our family law practice with Joanna uh, joining us. Um, and we have four or five primary practice areas, you know, corporate M&A work uh, where Evan does spends, spends most of his time labor and employment law, and that's everything from handbooks, non-compete agreements, severance, severance agreements, day-to-day -day employment matters, uh, to employment litigation. We work with uh, many, many government contractors, everything from teaming agreements, subcontract agreements, to bid protest, uh, and have very experienced government contracts attorneys. We have a large dispute resolution litigation practice where we're litig litigating cases uh, throughout the DC metropolitan area. Uh, Virginia, Maryland, and DC courts. And of course, we have our family law practice. Um, so with that, uh, here's a quick uh, overview of what we're gonna be doing. Evan's gonna be talking about, you know, structuring things that businesses can do to protect the business uh, through formation and their corporate documents. And then Joanna will be speaking about, uh, you know, issues related to divorce uh, and what you can do to protect the business from there. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Evan. And before you jump into your presentation, why don't you just give a, a quick overview of your background and some of the work that you're doing for clients sort of on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, absolutely. My um, name is Evan St. John. I've been with General Counsel PC uh, since January. Um, really enjoyed my time here. Um, and I am the senior corporate counsel for the firm. Um, in my time here, I, I help people primarily with setting up new businesses, getting their organizational documents uh, drafted and in place, um, and also assisting people with uh, mergers and acquisitions, as well as some employment needs as those arise. Um, I previously came from another uh, small firm in, in town over in Oakton, uh, where I was also helping primarily small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, so the vast majority of my legal experience has been uh, with those those smaller businesses and helping people to uh, both protect themselves and get the documents they need to to have a, a successful business. Um, and those those size businesses are the ones that are particularly uh, vulnerable to uh, ownership and management uh, going through divorce. So they're they'll be sort of the, the key focus of our discussion. And one fun fact about Evan is that he is a bassist in a a rock and roll band with apparently you know four or five hundred people showing up at a park in dc to see them every weekend if anyone wants to see or saturday, yeah. saturday from seven to nine in rose park in georgetown there we go and joanna why don't we go ahead and give a quick overview of your practice too and then we'll just jump into the presentation although i am not in a band i like to think i'm pretty cool too uh my name is joanna ford as Merritt said i lead the family law practice at general counsel i was so pleased to join the firm this year um, so I mainly focus on divorces or two unmarried parents with minor children and what a wonderful webinar and idea to put together today because a lot of times my clients either are business owners or married to someone that owns a business and there are a lot of questions that come up and um, I think that this is going to be really valuable and um, we're available to answer any questions either within this setting, or if you'd like to speak privately with us, uh, we'd be happy to do so as well. Wonderful. All right, so with that, uh, Evan, there's the first slide. Why don't you go ahead and uh, take it away? All righty. Uh, well, as Joanna was sort of uh, discussing a moment ago, 
Uh, I'll be talking from the perspective of mostly the company itself or the business owners of the company, um, either dealing with equity holders who are going through a divorce or uh, anticipating uh, the occasion where one of their owners may be going through a divorce. And Joanna will be talking more from the perspective of an individual going through divorce who happens to be a business owner. Um, so we'll have slightly different perspectives, um, but both are really helpful to make sure that uh, if you're involved in a business, you're, you're well protected in the event that uh, a divorce does uh, here its head. Um, so to begin with, uh, one of the, the main key things you can do to anticipate a divorce before it happens is to make sure that you have both uh, drafted and executed um, a good set of, if you're an LLC, an operating agreement, if you're a corporation, uh, some, some combination of a shareholders agreement or bylaws. Uh, usually the restrictions that I'll be talking about are found in the shareholders agreement, um, but sometimes they make their way into the bylaws as well. Um, one of the, the key things that you can do are to uh, flesh out the conditions under which uh, equity can be transferred by owners of the company. Um, oftentimes you can explicitly include a provision that says, we as shareholders or members of this uh, organization agree that uh, equity cannot be transferred in the case of a divorce uh, without the consent of the other members. Um, that is the most straightforward way to prevent a lot of these issues that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, there are also more nuanced ways to control equity if you're okay with some, per some percentage of that going to uh, the ex-spouse of a business member, um, for example, um, if you put in a provision that says, uh, you know, as, if you go through a divorce, the other members of the company uh, have a, a right to repurchase the equity that you hold, um, or alternatively repurchase the portion of the equity that is going to your ex-spouse. Um, that can be a, a very useful block that um, makes sure at least that the uh, person going through a divorce can get sort of uh, liquidity Necessary, necessary to negotiate the divorce. So a lot of times you'll have an issue where you know, both parties think that uh, the shares or membership interests of a company are, you know, have a certain value, but getting someone to buy those is, is a much more difficult thing. So what you can do is you can write in a repurchase right, either voluntary or mandatory. And that way you can trade those interests for money that can be, then be used to negotiate the divorce. Um, and sometimes that's just a lot easier to work with. Um, Another thing you can do is, uh, especially with LLCs, it's easier to do, but you can actually require that any member that joins into the LLC, um, if they're unmarried, uh, upon getting married or prior to getting married, they have to actually present evidence of a prenuptial agreement that says that the, the spouse is not entitled to any of the business interests of the company. Evan, how often are you seeing that with uh, you know, LLCs or, or small business clients? where they're uh, actually offering or requiring a prenup uh, as it relates to ownership in the business? So that is less frequent than just a total transfer block. I think just because administratively it's easier. Um, requir requiring the prenup also uh, can, can cause more issues because it sort of puts the liability on the, on the business member who's getting divorced rather than the, than the former spouse of that person. Um, because if they don't get that prenup, then they are potentially liable for, uh, you know, not having done that, which a lot of times you don't want to punish your business partner. You want to prevent the business partner's spouse from getting access to equity. You know, and a lot of these restrictions are, are they the same type of restrictions that we'd have in place, you know, or similar with the de death or disability of one of the business owners. You know, you often hear, you know, you, you, you form a business with three or four folks, you know, and something happens to one of them, you don't necessarily want to end up in business with their spouse. You know, their spouse may be an absolutely wonderful person, but they know, might know nothing about government contracting or whatever your business is. So I, I think you have these same sort of restrictions for death of disability. Um, so, you know, is this really sort of best practices when you're forming a company, you have an operating agreement, a shareholders agreement, that you have these transfer restrictions for, I guess, the three Ds, you know, death, disability, or divorce. Yeah, and those, those are often found in the very same provision as sub, of subparts of that, uh, that transfer restriction section. Um, I think 
they are so typical as well, the, the, the total transfer restrictions that I, you shouldn't be wary of including them. I think one of the problems with death and divorce um, are that people think it might be gauche to include those sorts of things or that it somehow you know, looks uh, like you're being negative, but they're, they're inherent parts of most of these agreements and they're absolutely typical in a business context. So don't be afraid to uh, either put them in or if they're not in, ask or require that they be put in because they really can't help protect you when things go wrong. Well, and it's probably a much easier way to do it because whereas there's, um, there are negative connotations with the prenuptial agreement often, uh, you know, even though Joanna will say that they're very helpful and they shouldn't necessarily have some of those negative connotations. But if you're doing it as part of the corporate operating agreement and everyone's doing it and mm -hmm. it's, you know, dealing with death, disability and divorce, you know, and includes those spousal consents, um, you know, it, it's it's necessary for the business right. as opposed to potentially planning for divorce right so and as i was saying before these restrictions are adopted by the business to run the business so there's a level of sort of plausible plausible deniability that uh, what you're putting in there is you know not specific to you as a person or anybody else as a person you're just looking out for the, the business interests of the company um, well and so it's also probably something that uh investors might require if they're coming in and you're raising money from friends and family, you know, VC, private equity, or anyone else along those lines, it would probably be absolutely expected and demanded uh, for any company in that circumstance. Yeah, that's a very common requirement. Um, you can also, it is worth noting that you can, you have to uh, assume that these will be enforceable um, and make sure that you're okay with that. Um, I was reading about a Virginia case that uh, was just recently over, uh, overridden by new legislation um, but they did not clearly state that um, up, upon divorce, the LLC wouldn't uh, automatically dissolve. Um, and so they had written it, that in there to prevent you know, a logjam from occurring if a unwanted partner came into the business. Um, but what they instead ended up doing was administratively dissolving their company when they didn't actually want to do that. Um, mm -hmm. So you do need to think through the ramifications of what you're doing and presume that the court will uphold them. Um, you know, sometimes they're not upheld, but they still have value because, uh, especially in law, a lot of uh, what you're going for is the, the appearance of, of order. And um, you know, you, if, a, if a spouse who is divorcing a business owning spouse sees that there is language in these agreements that will ostensibly prevent that transfer, they're much likely to fight for it in court. And they're much more likely to say, this is a giant hassle. Why don't you just pay me the monetary value of that and I'll go away? Um, and that mm -hmm. could be a very valuable thing, especially when emotions are high. You know, a question for you, Joanna. If a client were to come to you who was a business owner, you know, perhaps owned it with two other individuals, um, they don't have a good operating agreement or shareholders agreement, you know, and the individual comes to you and says, you know, things aren't getting a, a, along very well with my spouse. And I think there's a possibility in the next, year or two we might end up getting divorced um prenup agreement or postnup um uh would not work in that regard would you consider um uh sorry would you consider having them modify uh and update their operating agreement and shareholder agreement and then that circumstance I think definitely anything that we could get in writing, um, certainly to try to protect the potential, you know, uh, the dissolution of marriage, anything that we could do to protect that business asset as creative, creative as we need to be. And I know I always say this on all the webinars I participate in, but you know, every set of circumstances is different. So certainly if someone is recognizing facts and circumstances or thinking, oh, this might apply to me, certainly reach out to us. We're happy to discuss that. This is more like a broad brush um, talking about potential. So this is not meant to be legal advice, but certainly I'm any to give those disclaimers for you at the beginning. So <laughs> but it's so fun. No, but I think realistically anything that we can get in writing, because often I say too, a lot of things that come up in family law are he said, she said, or you have two parties testifying 
So any written documentation signed by the parties or interested individuals that is favorable certainly is something that we would want to have. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think for, uh, just quickly for business owners, you know, even if you have a wonderful marriage and you don't think there's any chance that you're going to get divorced or you're you're not even married, uh, you'll want your business partners to to have these documents in place. Because again, you don't want your business impacted and your ownership uh, impacted by one of your business partners going through a divorce. You know, and the havoc that that could reach, uh, cause, um, you know, and potential ownership and other issues. Yeah. Um, and also, if you, you know, there, there are lighter touches that you can take. Um, for example, on on this slide here, um, you know, you don't have to have a a, a complete transfer on on equity uh, be prevented. You can also do things like. Uh, prevents the the incoming uh, ex-spouse from having management rights, but they would still get the economic benefits from holding those interests. So uh, it would effectively be like your old business partner owns all of those, uh, all of that equity, but just has to sort of have an arrangement where they give certain amounts of money upon distribution to that ex-spouse. Um, and that's a lot less disruptive to the business. So if you're worried about uh, either appearances or that being too too firm of a rule, uh, there are lighter touches you can take. Um, one final thing is, uh, you can, one thing you can also do in shareholders agreements and operating agreements is agree before time as to how you're going to value the shares. Um, because as I'm sure Joanna will tell you, oftentimes there are fights over what a company is worth. Um, and that can be in a good faith way, just because people have access to different information, or it can be an eventual thing because the value of a, a business is oftentimes subjective. Um, and so you want to have evidence of you know, an agreement beforehand so that uh, a judge can simply say, here's what you agreed to, I'm, I'm going to hold you to that, um, because that's a lot easier to administer. Um, and Evan, and will you have the same manner of valuation for death, disability, divorce, partnership, ownership disputes, or might you even have a a different valuation methodology depending on the circumstances. I know that oftentimes when a an owner who's perhaps an employee is terminated for cause mm -hmm. or otherwise leaves the company is no longer employed, you might have a different discounted manner of valuation than you would in other circumstances. Yes, they can be different. And one of the most common ones that you'll see is the valuation is simply uh, the value that was paid at the time that the member entered the LLC or the shareholder got the shares. Um, and that can be bad if the, the company has grown a lot over time, but it also guarantees that at least the each party can, can walk away uh, without losing money. Um, and you know, oftentimes that's also intended to be slightly punitive because you want people to think through their actions and see how they'll affect the business. Uh, but ultimately it's a decision among all of the owners of the business. So uh, you know, it, as long as everyone agrees to that, it, it is a sensibly fair. Um, in business, no, absolutely. As a, yeah, yeah, in and business. sometimes what you'll do is have, um, you know, you'll bring in valuation experts. You know, mm -hmm. the, the one party brings in a valuation expert or the company does it based on, you know, recommendation from their CPA. And if there's any dispute to that, you, you know, bring in another valuation, and, but you, what's most important is have that operating agreement or shareholders agreement really spell out the processes and procedures yeah. and what we tell clients over and over again is it's so much better to have the documentation in place um, before you have any disputes because if you if you're trying to resolve an ownership dispute with no operating agreement or horrible operating agreement um, you know where someone's getting divorced and you don't have the documentation and processes in place you end up paying a lot more attorneys. It's a lot messier. So, yeah, anyone who's watching today, if you, you don't have a good operating agreement or shareholders agreement, you should be calling Evan or emailing him immediately. Um, all right. Be happy to have spousal well. consents. Uh, so moving along, uh, spousal consents are another type of document that uh, often accompanies operating agreements and shareholders agreements. Uh, they can stand alone, but the, what they do better than other documents is they really show that the spouse is involved in the decision. Um, there's a term in law called privity of contract. Um, and the idea of that is uh, privity means that 
it involves the partners who have knowledge of the contract and have voluntarily signed on to it. So if there is a business where all of the all of the members created a contract with the transfer restrictions, um, they all know what's involved in that and they've all they've all agreed to it. And a a spouse of a business partner may not. So if a divorce comes up, that spouse could come and say, well, that's great that you all agree to these things. I had no knowledge of them. And the court has you know, administratively granted me rights in this company. Uh, so it wasn't even really my choice to sign on to this. And I'm not going to be held to those transfer restrictions. A spousal consent is helpful because before any of this happens, you can get an acknowledgement that a spouse knows about the contents of an operating agreement. And if you want, has them waive any rights to membership interests uh, that may be marital property. Um, and again, heading stuff off early on is easier than doing it in the moment um, because you can easily prove what the expectation of the parties were and uh, disallow some of those he said, she said situations where the intent of the parties is not there. Um, Evan, do you think that these spous uh, spousal consents are uh, necessary or are they simply best practices? So in other words, if you don't have best uh, spousal consents in place, could other provisions for valuation and other things within a shareholder's agreement or operating agreement be determined to be ineffective? It is best to have them for sure. Uh, and I think it, it matters as to what type of provisions you include. So if it's a total transfer restriction, um, I don't know that a spousal consent is as necessary um, because it's just a, a total block and you're not actually putting obligations on that person, you're just saying they can't come in, in at all. I think if the provisions are sort of partial where, for example, someone will get equity but only get the economic benefits and not management, you know, in that scenario, they're coming in as a owner in some capacity and then getting rights denied to them. And you wanna make sure that they have agreed to that because they would actually be a party to that uh, agreement. Um, whereas if it was just blocked from being transferred to them, they're just sort of a side issue that never actually comes into the company. Um, but either way, it, it really doesn't, there's no scenario where it's a bad thing. Okay, very good. Well, I think with that, we're moving on to Joanna. But before we move on, Evan, any sort of additional thoughts on, uh, that you would provide the business owner? You know, I guess what yeah. I would think of is, if you have an operating agreement or shareholders agreement, um, you know, and maybe you started the business a few years ago and you, you did something with LegalZoom, but the business has grown since then, uh, you really should update it and make sure it is a comprehensive document that provides a, a roadmap for your business and uh, re resolution of any issues. Yeah, absolutely. And there, there are certain things that just sort of apply to all business owners with their business, with their partners. Um, Generally, 50-50 splits in equity are a bad idea because you don't want to be in a situation where the company can't make a decision. Um, and if you need majority votes uh, to do that, then you need unanim unanimity, which is not always available. So it's good to talk ahead of time and decide you know, who is the more experienced, more passionate person who's willing to you know, invest time and money into the company and make them the majority owner. Um, because sometimes you need decisive action and that can be very important, especially in the context of the divorce. Um, other things you'll also see is someone who is married may give a majority control to a spouse who is uh, either a woman or a, a minority who has a certain set aside contract privilege. Um, make sure that that person has an interest in continuing the company after a divorce, because otherwise, either they could you know, sell off the company or run it into the ground uh, through mismanagement or some other scenario. So make sure that if you do that, that you're both committed to continuing that as you know, respectful mutual business owners. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, I'll turn things over to Joanna and she can talk about things from the perspective of the folks going through the books. Yeah, and I apologize. Uh, Evan had one additional slide. Uh, so, but thank you, you Evan for <laughs> seamlessly uh, covering up my mistake and now we can go ahead and turn it over to Joanna, how are assets divided upon divorce? Thank you. So I really think like listening to Evan, you know, the first part of this webinar and also when we were preparing for this, I really feel like general counsel is such a great one-stop legal 
shop or whatever you want to say if you are a business owner or do have questions and you're married just in general i feel like you know there's the protecting the business aspect the civil law stuff but then you also have the divorce law world and you know just really making sure as merit and evan were both saying preventatively you know do i have all of my ducks in a row hopefully you guys put these documents in a drawer and live happily ever after and there's never any divorce never any dispute everything is great but what we're here to do is protect the just in case you know you work hard to build up a business and it's wonderful when it's successful so making sure that your goals are met and any future need to potentially protect it definitely always 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 best to have those documents in place ahead of time so just wanted to mention that so um, <laughs> here in the state of Virginia, we follow equitable distribution. So now we're turning to the divorce law world and um, equitable distribution does not necessarily mean a slice down the middle 50% division of every single asset and liability. What it means is that what we do is if there are parties that are going through a divorce, we make an equitable distribution worksheet and that is going to list all of the assets and liabilities of the marriage and uh, the valuation of them, but also the classification. And uh, there is marital, there are marital assets, there are separate assets, and there can be hybrid property as well. So if we go to the next slide, um, there's a little bit more information on these assets. So marital property is something it's jointly owned. So essentially, in our equitable distribution worksheet, those marital assets or liabilities marital property is something that we have to determine when we're doing our equitable distribution just trying to keep things fair so you know you can have a bunch of assets certain assets might be more valuable not necessarily monetarily but somebody might really want to hold on to a certain maybe piece of real property or maybe we have a business in place that you know rather than keeping one thing it's more important to the spouse to keep another rather than just dividing everything up um, and separate property are usually things that are acquired prior to marriage so think of you know purchasing a home prior to getting married um, or separate accounts or um, an inheritance you know those are usually things that are deemed separate property but it's important to note that it is possible to convert separate property into marital property or you know make that classification of hybrid so again as we were discussing you know it's really really important to make sure that you're protecting your assets whether that be through written documents you know dividing things in a certain way making sure everybody agrees or just the way that you manage um, assets joanna what about the situation where you know uh, three uh, folks start a business um, you know, none of them are married at the time, you know, uh, five years later, you know, let's say all of them are getting married. Um, you know, they don't really have a valuation of the business at that time. Um, you know, let's say they put in, had a good operating agreement or shareholders agreement. And then five years later, uh, they, you know, one of them is getting divorced. So 10 years after the business was started, five years after marriage, the, 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 business was worth, you know, give or take $10 million when they got married and it's now worth, you know, a hundred million dollars. So, you know, they're third or third or third owners, you know, so this person in theory has an asset that's worth $33 million now. Is that, how do you deal with sort of separate versus marital property and hybrid property in that situation and the 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 uh the valuation as it relates to equitable distribution well it depends if i represent the business owner or the non-business owner how i'm going to formulate my um argument but certainly you know typically the courts have held that the valuation of the property is going to be as of the date of separation so that's something very specific to virginia you know when we're looking for our valuation date um so valuing assets as of the date of separation so certainly um you know on the one hand the contributions of the non-business owner spouse maybe they remained home to allow the business owner spouse to be working and build that up 
you know, that could be one argument for why it should be considered a marital asset or, you know, more to the spouse that wasn't directly participating or, you know, the business owner spouse, if they kept everything completely separate, uh, maybe they had a full-time job as well. Uh, maybe they were very smart and called Evan before they, <laughs> you know, when they were forming the business and had documentation that, um, you know, protected it. So there are going to be a lot of different factors mm -hmm. that go into the classification. Um, but a lot of times you will also see competing business valuations. Um, yeah. So that's also something to consider too, especially when you have such a large swing from date of marriage to date of separation. You know, you might have experts come in uh, demonstrating uh, the increase and, you know, the marital efforts and maybe the non-owner spouse can demonstrate through their efforts they assisted in building up the business. It it really can, there are a lot of layers to that. Is the value of the business when they got married, that $10,000 excluded, will that automatically be separate property or sort of could it become wrapped into marital, marital property? Typically we, it's just like all wrapped in to everything. Right. Um, but again, it depends who I represent and how creative we wanna be. But certainly, you know, um, when we get these specific factors, a, a great place to do a uh, look is also case law, because a lot of times situations like this have come up before. And, you know, looking in our jurisdiction, whatever that may be um, on the particular facts and circumstances, seeing how courts have ruled previously on these issues can also be very beneficial. You know, and I love these hypotheticals. What about the situation where, um, uh, you know, three business owners, business is worth 250 million, um, and one of them gets married, um, uh, and they own a third, a third, a third. One of them gets married. Six months later, they get divorced. No prenup. Um, you know, in that circumstance, I assume after six months of marriage, the divorcing spouse isn't entitled to, you know, 50% of that you know, share of the $250 million company. I mean, we definitely, if we're representing the business center, we definitely would want to make that argument that it was not through marital efforts. It was not during the marriage that, you know, this business was built up and, you know, has become this valuable and that it would be inequitable, you know, because we have the courts have to look at equitable distribution and just saying, you know, stroking someone a check for 50% of that business owners and not just for a six month period yep. really would be inequitable. I think that would be the argument there. So it's the, the value of the assets during the term of the marriage. Yes, now, typically we are looking at that. In the situation where uh, we have our three business partners again and they have their business that's doing really well, two of them have gotten married, but one of them, you know, sort of is from California, not to disparage anyone from California, and they were raised on a commune, and they really just don't believe in marriage. And in all ways, except having the legal document, they hold themselves out, and they live in Virginia, hold themselves out as being married, although they each have their, you know, maiden names, um, you know, they have kids, you know, uh, own a house together, you know, what happens to that uh, situation where, you know, they get to, uh, they, I guess, break up, you know, I guess they can't get divorced, you know, and the one spouse who's the non-business owner says, okay, I want my 50% of the increase in value of this company. That's a great question. It's a common question. And in the state of Virginia, we do not have common law marriage. So essentially, um, certain states recognize that there are two parties that hold themselves out as a married couple, as husband and wife in the community. Um, you know, are living together, their finances are together, um, you know, and a lot of times in other states, rather than requiring you to like actually get married to do a division, they'll say, okay, you, you've been deemed com common law marriage applies. Yep. State of Virginia, no go. So unfortunately, uh, divorce laws and, you know, my services would not be <laughs> appropriate. That's when you'd be calling Evan and doing more civil law because um, there is no common law marriage. So the unmarried non-business owner through the family law courts would not have an entitlement. They, they wouldn't have standing to file um, something in divorce court. So unless you're married, can never go through divorce court. So in this scenario, 
in theory, you know, they were married, they were together for 40 years, end up getting divorced. The one spouse didn't work, stayed home with the kids. You know, business went from 10 million to, you know, 500 million under divorce court principles. They don't get a penny out of that valuation, you know, and it might be hard to argue that they get value, uh, you know, otherwise, um, you know, whether contract or other theories. So something just to, to keep in mind is you need to get married in these situations because they give you legal protections that you don't otherwise have. Right. Or have some other document other than a prenup or postnup, yeah. um, such that Evan was discussing earlier, that would protect the non-business owner spouse, not necessarily in the um, marriage realm, but maybe at, you know protecting them some way to be entitled to a portion of the business. Yeah, I was about to jump in with the same thing. Marriage is sort of a collection of contractual rights for the most part. So even if you don't get married, there are many things that you can do to make sure that on separating from one another, uh, property goes where you have both agreed it should go. Um, and those things can be done just by a traditional contract as well. So mm -hmm. if that's what you need, make sure to seek that out earlier. Yes. Absolutely. And our next two slides actually go in more detail. So we'll probably just like breeze through those. Just essentially, we're talking about the monetary and non-monetary contribution of each party, how we were saying if one party stayed home, while the other party was able to build up the business, the duration of the marriage, we were talking about a six month and a 40 years. So, so these are all the factors that the court is going to look at when they are making that marital, non-marital, um, separate property or hybrid property determination. So we can just click through these next two. And then how to protect your business. That's why we're here. So um, we've kind of touched on these topics already. But essentially, I would say if I could narrow this down, the number one thing would be an agreement of some type, having that written documentation that is executed either prior to the marriage or during the marriage that demonstrates that both parties have full knowledge of the you know, situation of the business and the current value and you know, potential if the business value does grow, that the parties both agree on the division and you know what's fair getting something like that signed i'm telling you i've seen it <laughs> and unfortunately you know disputes regarding businesses in the divorce world really can get extremely expensive um so certainly having an attorney prepare an agreement like that which really is not that complicated typically um is going to serve you well tenfold so um, on this slide, we have a few tips to protect your business. Um, we've, like, like we said, um, Evan was saying earlier, you know, just having those types of agreements. Um, certainly, the uh, having your spouse participate in the business. You know, maybe they're doing the books for you. Maybe that you know they have a salary. A anything that is making the other, the non-business owner spouse participate in the running of the business is going to further their argument should you end up in divorce court that they should be entitled to a portion of the business. Not only was I staying home with the children, I ran the books for 40 years, or I went to those site visits, or I you know, those types of things. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So um, yeah, just basically what Evan was saying, you know, I, <laughs> I would definitely say call Evan um, to have him prepare some documentation for you um, before the marriage is always preferable if we can do that, but it's not, you know, something that's impossible to do if you are already married. It's just we want to make sure um, that the other spouse wouldn't have any argument regarding like duress or coercion. So we'd want to make sure the other spouse has an opportunity to have an attorney review any documentation that we're making full financial disclosures. Um, before we get everything signed what about just sort of best practices when you're starting the business mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know you know client comes to us evan and they're starting a new business um you know where it's an llc here in virginia um we're, we're doing a good uh operating agreement for them because they plan on growing um you know and we have the spousal consents and everything else along those lines 
Mm -hmm. Would we recommend the spouse in that circumstance have his or her own attorney before signing the spousal consents? You know, even though it is just part of the corporate formation, the LLC formation process that we're, we're going through? Yeah, I think in that situation, you always at least recommend that they get counsel and have counsel review things before they, they are signed, just because like Joanna said, you don't want them to be able to make the case that they were coerced into it or didn't understand the language of it. Um, you know, Ultimately, a lot of times you can't force people to get counsel. And a lot of times they don't want to take the, the money to do that up front. Um, but especially if you have uh, in your spousal consent you know, language that says, it's recommended that you have an attorney review this beforehand and you acknowledge that you have received this message. Um, that can be helpful in, in just making sure that they can't uh, claim that it's any, anything untoward happened where they signed it and did not actually mean to sign it. Absolutely. And I love something that Merritt just said, which is if you're forming a business and you intend for it to grow or be successful, because a lot of times you see people that had no clue how successful their business would be. And because of that, they didn't have these agreements in place in the beginning. So I would say from that, you know, let's just hope you'll be successful. And um, even if you're not having these documents could save so much in the end. So I would say it's always a good idea to have okay. these agreements. If you're starting a company, you should believe in yourself and believe it's going to grow. And so if you believe it's going to grow, there are certain things you need to have in place to prepare yourself. That's always good to be optimistic and prepared. Well, and I think the along those lines, I think the only time you can skimp, if that is the right word, in starting a business is if you own it by yourself. You know, if it's a single member, LLC, you know, you own the company by yourself, perhaps in that regard, you don't need a good operating agreement or anything else. You don't even need a shareholder's agreement. Oftentimes you can have an operating statement, if anything. But otherwise, if there are two or more owners, you should have proper documentation. Yeah. You know, it just, it's, you, you eliminate so many problems in the future. All right, marital agreements. Yes, so marital agreements, I feel like that's <laughs> my number one tip of the day, just, you know, having that documentation ahead of time. I can't say it enough because I don't see it enough. So, um, you know, certainly reaching out and letting us help you to protect your business is always a good idea, as we mentioned. If it's an agreement that you're executing prior to getting married, that's called a prenuptial agreement. Uh, if you're already married, no matter how long you've been married, um, you, you're able to execute an agreement um, and that's a postnuptial agreement. And then once divorce proceedings have begun, that's when it would be a separation agreement. Joanna, how often are you seeing postnuptial agreements? You know, I, I can imagine right now, just even personally, if my wife were to come to me and say, hey, Merrick, you know, Things are going really well with the company and where I'm working. And, you know, who knows what the future holds? Yeah, you know, I really want you to sign this, this post-nuptial agreement, giving up certain rights. I, I probably wouldn't be that happy about it. <laughs> well, I mean, especially with the crazy year that everyone has had, you know, um, whether people have done very well financially or not, um, you know, you're, you're seeing more and more people seeing that the certainty of businesses or your income or your assets and liabilities are not necessarily what we thought. So there, there is an increase and don't worry, <laughs> your, I bet your wife, there's not a chance she's <laughs> gonna do that, but um, no. And, and I feel like a lot of times um, you also see that uh, people sometimes are worried to do a prenuptial agreement, even though they probably should. And um, because of that, uh, you know, people have been married for a while, maybe it is, you know, family money or family business that the family really wanted the parties to enter a prenuptial agreement. It just didn't happen for one reason or another. You know, I've also seen later down the line, the parties are happily married, hopefully never going to result in a divorce, but it is the smartest thing because there are other individuals involved to execute that postnuptial agreement. Yeah, and I think that's exactly right. And we've dealt with a number of client situations, you know, particularly dealing with prenups, where it's a second marriage for the business owner who's getting married, where it's, you know, a family business that's owned with other family members. And if they don't want upon a divorce, you know, it, it having to, that family ownership being uh, diluted in any manner, where there's, you know, other similar considerations. 
um, you know, blended families or things along those lines. You know, the in-laws might help, you know, not like the, the one spouse, you know, and, you know, whatever the circumstances are, I, I think that's really when you, you consider the prenup also, and there's probably a better justification for it uh, in that regard. Most definitely, and something really to remember when it comes to prenups, postnups, things like that. The reason that we're doing that is, you know, the main reason is that if you file for divorce in, you know, in the state of Virginia, and you don't have an agreement already regarding the distribution of that asset or liability, it's just going to be whatever the law in Virginia states or whatever that judge determines versus you're able to really craft an agreement and really think through things and have that protection that would not otherwise be available to you. Essentially, you can't agree to something that's not legal, but you are able to agree to things that um, if you just went through the traditional divorce process wouldn't necessarily be available. So if, for example, it should be an equal division of a you know, large amount of money because this business is worth a lot, and that's what Virginia law provides. If you don't have an agreement, that, that's what's going to happen versus if the parties have made this agreement, entered into um, you know, either a prenup or a postnup or any other type of document that's held valid, you're really able to you know, do whatever you both feel is best rather than having to be confined by the laws of Virginia. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. We've already talked okay. about distancing your spouse yeah. a little bit. Why don't you go ahead a little bit more? Yeah. So basically, um, if you don't have that agreement in place um, and you are looking at a dispute, um, certain things that the court will be looking at as how involved the non-business owner spouse was in essentially making the business successful. So tips to avoid that type of situation would be, as we said, you know, if your spouse is running the books for 40 years, they're probably going to have a good argument that thanks to them, your business was able to grow and be successful. Um, if they're earning, uh, if they're on the payroll, whether or not they're, you know, actively nine to five, Monday through Friday, showing up, but if they're able to demonstrate, you know, that, that basically that they were part of the business, that just furthers their argument that they should be entitled to uh, receiving part of that. And I think this list here and some of the other things we've spoken about um, sort of uh, drives home the point that if as a business owner, you think that there's a possibility that you might be getting divorced in the next, you know, one to three years, you know, you're going through some marriage counseling or whatever the circumstances are, it's really never too early to contact Evan and Joanna, you know, because you may want to take some of these preventative measures. You may want to update the operating agreement or shareholders agreement, um, you know, and not wait until one of the, the spouses moved out and you're officially separated because it might actually be too late at that point. Because I guess, as Joanna said, equitable distribution goes from date of marriage to date of separation. I've been listening, Joanna. <laughs> I'm so impressed. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Anything else here? Or next slide. Next slide. All right. So um, negotiating with other assets, this is what we were talking about earlier when we're making our equitable distribution worksheet. We have a list of all the assets and liabilities of the marriage. We're classifying those and we're determining what's equitable to a, an equitable way to distribute them. Um, negotiating with other assets, you know, like we said earlier, if there are particular assets such as a business or, um, you know, the larger assets, usually if there's a large retirement account, if there's real property, uh, very valuable artwork sometimes, uh, things like that. If those things are very important to one spouse to retain, a lot of times you can kind of balance the worksheet by saying, okay, I'm going to retain 100% of the value of my business. You're going to waive any and all right title interest claim that you might have now and in the future but you know you get to keep the former marital residence the beach house, whatever it may be and even if those numbers aren't totally equaling so that everybody is with the same amount of money um you know you might it might be early in the business and you know you want to continue forward and watch it grow and make sure that you're protecting it um in the future and you're doing some of these things if perhaps you don't have the operating agreement, the shareholders agreement, you know, the prenup agreement, 
Exactly. Yeah. So th these are those measures um, that that you haven't protected yourself, but these are kind of tips um, and ideas to think about. Okay. Um, this really goes toward um, when we're classifying marital separate hybrid property. So if you don't have your prenuptial or postnuptial agreement and you are using funds that you have earned during the marriage to further that business, again, that could be seen as, you know, building up your business by way of using marital funds. And uh, that could be an argument for the non-business owner spouse to say that you used marital funds. And even though this business might be classified as non-marital, uh, that it's essentially been commingled or portion of the business should be determined that it is marital um, and that the non-business owner spouse should be entitled to reimbursement or you know, recouping some value there. What about using, you know, for small businesses, um, you know, you probably see it more than you should, but a small business owner will often, you know, uh, pay for the family trip to, you know, uh, Jamaica as a business expense or, you know, buy, you know, groceries or dinners as a business expense when, when perhaps technically it's not strictly. I imagine the same rule applies. If you're using business monies to pay for personal expenses, one, the IRS might come after you, but two, it could um, uh, it could make it more likely that it is a, a marital asset. Most definitely, and that's something that we see all the time too. Like that's just such a quick way to make that argument that you know it, it hasn't been totally separate, and you know marital funds, have, you know just all of that commingling just furthers the argument and makes it more and more in the marital column rather than separate property. Good. That's Before we go to the next slide, we do have a question. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Evan. Yeah, that's bad for a number of reasons too, but one of the things you wanna do as a business owner is if you have an LLC or a corporation, you know, having that, that business structure there can protect you from liability um, if someone sues your company. But if you're using that company for private uses, um, you know, they can make an argument that there is no company at all and it's just you um, and they can come after you personally. So even outside of the divorce context, you want to make sure to keep a, a fairly solid wall between the business and your own expenses. Yeah, you don't want to open yourself up for the piercing the corporate veil is the, the term that's generally used. So here's a question. Uh, if a spouse has funds in a 401k from the company before the marriage of $50,000, and 10 years later, it's worth $150,000, what portion is considered marital? Typically, the courts are going to look at uh, valuation, the date of marriage. So I think you said there were 50,000. Um, so, and then so we got up to 100. Yes, so generally speaking, again, you know, we'd have to <laughs> look more in detail, but typically it would be that 100,000 during the marriage. So the marital portion typically is from the date of marriage through the date of separation. You're just going to pull those account statements. So typically that 50,000 premarital would be uh, deemed separate property. There'd be a great argument to make there. And, and something else that's a little outside the scope of what we're talking about now, but if one spouse um, had not been working the whole time, those retirement monies can be transferred to the non-working spouse and you keep the favorable tax treatment through a QRDO? <laughs> I love the legal terms you're using too, like outside the scope, <laughs> objection outside the scope. Um, yeah, exactly. So uh, we have methods uh, like quadro is uh, the term. So QDRO, Qualified Domestic Relations Order. And that is a document that can be prepared and um, essentially makes the transfer from one retirement account to another right retirement account a non-taxable event. So if, for example, that 100,000 was deemed to be marital and the other spouse was entitled to $50,000 of that, a qualified domestic relations order could transfer those funds from one spouse to another, make it non-taxable. However, it's very important to remember that when the recipient spouse or even the payor spouse is removing um, an amount or those funds either in some or part, uh, the tax effects would occur. So you want to make sure that you have a tax professional involved 
um, speak with your divorce attorney about that um, to make sure that you're, you're being as smart as possible with your money because that's very important. Very good. Okay, All right. timing we, matters. Perfect. We have five minutes and we're on our last slide. Timing matters. So um, essentially, again, I, I would say the big takeaway here is that as early as possible, getting things, you know, documented as far as agreements and you're going to be better off. So um, as we talked about, you know, if you're seeing Evan, if you're seeing me, if you're seeing both of us, just to make sure I's are dotted and T's are crossed, um, you know, whether or not your newly formed business or, you know, business that is very successful already, it's important to protect those assets and make sure that should um, dissolution of marriage occur, that those assets are going to be protected and any value is distributed in a way that, you know, is favorable to both of you and a, a way that you both agree, essentially. Wonderful. So with that, um, you know, Evan, do you want to do any sort of final thoughts and then Joanna, you can also? Uh, um, yeah, absolutely. I think as we're talking about a variety of relationships, whether they're marital or business, um, you need to make sure to communicate with the people you're involved with and establish expectations. Um, and having things in writing is so much easier than having, uh, you know, a he said, she said type situation. So, you know, whether it's with your business partner or your spouse, have a conversation, sit down and say, you know, where do you see us in a number of years and what are your expectations should things go around? Um, and I think that that can serve you well in a number of, uh, of venues in life, but uh, particularly with, with legal considerations, um, just make sure that you write things down and, and, and come to an agreement. Great. All right. And Joanna, before you, uh, we have another question here. Let's see. A single owner LLC and the spouse has worked in a service business, depend, service business dependent uh uh, based on the owner, medical practice from startup without salary. Okay, so single member LLC spouse has worked supporting, I guess, the owner of that LLC, a medical practice, uh, without salary. So we're already talking thinking about equitable issues there. Um, from the startup without salary, how is the spouse value imputed? Not getting salary at separation. Is it best to start a salary or not after eight years? That I probably would have some additional questions and want to talk through further um, before giving a definitive <laughs> direction to go. But um, yeah, I would say I, I would probably have some additional follow up questions. Um, you know, I think it'd be interesting. So uh, there are sort of two questions there. One is, you haven't received a salary, mm -hmm. you know, where do you have that for valuation? And I think in that regard, you go through the equitable distribution uh, criteria and the, the husband and wife are sort of working as a team, it would seem, for the business, um, you know, and probably sharing money related to the business. Um, and you'd probably equal to be distributed for that regard. Um, as it relates to whether or not you should start a salary or not, if they're still married, I'm not sure it would matter. But as you said, there are probably additional considerations as it relates to determining that valuation. Yeah, and I would say we might need to get like a business valuation or determining the value of the work that's been done for eight years and what a fair salary would be. Because another thing to consider is that if someone is highly underpaid or highly overpaid, um, you know, those might be things that might harm us in the end, uh, yeah. you know. And I guess one other consideration is, you know, if let's say the business owner spouse had a 401k set up mm -hmm. and they were paying themselves 401k contributions and the, the spouse that was supporting the business was not getting that, that's something else to be considered in that circumstance. Um, but obviously, I think uh, that is a perfect question to follow up with Joanna and you have her email right there. Uh, another question is, who pays for the valuation if both spouses uh, don't have the money to pay for it? And what date is used for the valuation of the business? So I can say that the date of the valuation would be marriage and then all the way through separation, generally. 
Um, what happens if no one can pay for the valuation? So I've seen courts do different things um, because if, if you aren't agreeing as to who is going to pay, that's when you'd have to go to court and a judge would decide that. Um, typically, I, what I've seen is that the court will look at who has access to the funds to pay it. And a lot of times the court will require that individual say there's a retirement or savings account or access to the funds to pay, even if the parties are generally uh, similarly situated financially. And the court will often put uh, that the division of the uh, amount that is paid by the one spouse is to be later determined. So it's not that one spouse is required to pay 100% and that's it. A lot of times you'll see it'll later be determined usually through equitable distribution and uh you know maybe that spouse will be repaid by additional funds um, from different accounts later so one would be paid up front and then it would be evened out later on exactly great well i think that was the last of the questions we are i think about one minute over time so joanna if you just want to say goodbye or provide some parting wisdom i think we can finish up I just want to thank everybody for logging in. I want to thank Evan and Merritt for doing this webinar with me. I think, um, you know, this is just a quick snack of <laughs> information. And if there are any topics that we discuss that you want to discuss further, if this is, you know, you've thought of questions either for yourself or someone that you know that might benefit from talking to us, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Evan and I are both, well, I'm speaking for him, but Typically, what I like to do is anyone that mentions that they attended the webinar, whether it's your friend that you told about this or something like that, just have them write that. And, um, you know, I'm happy to provide a free 30 minute consultation just to talk to them and see if we're able to assist. But we're certainly here and ready to help in any way that we can. And we appreciate the participation today. Yeah, absolutely. And the one last uh, thing I'll say is, um, you know, Evan and Joanna are, are both spectacular attorneys. Um, Joanna has done a tremendous job um, getting client reviews. Um, so if you Google her name uh, and there's a website called AVO, A-V-V-O, I think she's up to 120 some uh, client reviews. So if anyone listening today or family, friends uh, here in Northern Virginia needs a divorce attorney, take a look at the uh, Joanna's reviews. Um, you know, her, her clients absolutely love her and it's an indication of the work that she's done and uh, you'd be in great hands working with her. So please take a look at that. And if you have any follow-up questions, please call us or email us. And thank you so much. Thank you everyone. All right, for you go. Hopefully I'll end it without too many buttons. There we go. Take care. Thank you.